Cool, thank you. Well, thank you, Oli, for inviting me. Thanks, guys, for coming. I guess it's holiday weekend, long weekend, so you're, you're brave to be here. And I just wanted to amplify what Oli said about uh, we have a rather small research group for now, but we're always interested in collaborations. Um, there's some opportunities to come as a visiting researcher, either through us or through the DAAD uh, here in Germany. So if you're interested in you know, coming to, to Yale for a little bit, a few months, let, let me know. Really open to, to, uh, to getting people in our group. Um, and, and on that note, um, this work is actually a joint work with uh, Nicholas uh, Sebastian, who was actually visiting us for a few months a um, year or two ago, and Professor Katzenbeiser and TU Darmstadt. So we tried to make up for our small size with some external collaborations. But like, um, like Uli mentioned, um, I'll talk about uh, kind of using or abusing smartphone sensors uh, to kind of gather side and convert channel uh, communications between um, a computer device and your, and your smartphone. So I'll give you some introduction about kind of the design of a modern smartphone. I'll talk about some uh, sensors that are available on the smartphone, um, in particular the solid state compass. And then I'll also give some background on kind of operation of hard drives that you might be familiar with and how they generate magnetic fields and also on the operation of CPU and how you can uh, generate magnetic fields or how magnetic fields are generated as the CPU runs. And uh, basically we'll use these um, kind of these as the, as the sources of uh, side and convert channel, and then on the other side, there's going to be the smartphone that is picking up the, the information through the, through the magnetic sensor. And uh, we have two, two, two research topics that I wanted to focus on in the second half of the talk. One is on uh, side channel information using smartphones, and the other one is on covert communication uh, from, the, uh, from the CPU and then the hard drive. And I'll give some conclusions and ideas for potential defenses. So, um, so let's get started. So uh, this is a typical modern smartphone. You know, inside you have many cores um, for processing. You have gigabytes for uh, data storage. You have uh, flash memory for persistent storage. But uh, the most interesting thing is all these, all these different sensors that you have in your phone. You have a proximity sensor. You have microphone. Actually, I found out recently that there are two or three microphones in the phone, so you get a stereo recording. Um, there is a magnetometer or a, or a digital compass, which we're, um, we're going to focus on. You know, GPS, camera, all these. All these different sensors are available on your phone. And um, interestingly, um, I'll mention this later, um, for a lot of these sensors, either you don't need explicit permission to access that, so you download a random uh, app. So in particular, for the Compass, there's no, there's no permission setting. Basically, any app can use the Compass without you knowing it. And for the other sensors, uh, I, at least in my own experience, people just, there's no option. You accept the, you know, the, uh, the permissions they request for the sensor. So it's really hard for users to opt out from uh, using some or denying an app some use of these sensors. So you download some, uh, some game on your phone, and suddenly it's recording the kind of the magnetic field around you, and you don't even know it's, it's going on. But um, if you open up a, a smartphone, you, you'll find uh, you know, the battery, and then this is the, um, this is the motherboard. Um, and there are different websites. This is ifixit.com, which is really cool. You can look at the high resolution photos of the teardown of the phone so you can see what's, what's inside, just laptops, other devices. And um, so this is just the, the motherboard that's taken out of the phone. Um, and we're kind of zooming in you know, on the, you know, you can see there are different um, memory and CPU and some other components are highlighted. Uh, but what we're interested in is this little guy here uh, in, the top, uh, in the top corner. So it's, uh, this, is, so this, is a, um, this is a solid state um, um, electronic compass. Um, there are different different variations in different phones, but each phone now has a has a very nice um, very nice solid state uh, solid state compass that you can uh, basically use to read the, the magnetic field of your um, of your surroundings. And um, so the basis for the for the solid state um, compass operation is the is the Hall effect. So the idea is that you have a, um, a piece of a conducting material and you pass a current through it, and in presence um, in presence of a magnetic field, so you have a so this is the material. You're passing some current through it. And if there's, um, if there's a magnetic field, uh, there's a, there's a uh, potential difference created across this material. So if you, um, so if you measure the, um, the, the voltage, the potential difference, and if you know the, what, the, what the input current is, uh, you can figure out what is the magnetic field. So basically, by having different, these they're called Hall elements, inside the, inside, the, um, inside the package, you can basically figure out the magnetic field in a different um, in the different axes. And that's what's, um, that's what's used in, in most of the smartphones. There's also some MEMS-based uh, uh, magnetometers. And uh, just as a kind of like an overview, uh, basically you have rather good uh, precision from the, from the sensors. You can view uh, portions of microtesla per bit, and then you have uh, 
13 or some bits you can read out from the, the digital value of the, of the reading. So uh, you have uh, around plus or minus uh, 1,000 microtesla is the range for the readings for the sensors. Um, and it operates at, uh, uh, at least in our, in our experience, at 48 uh, hertz, uh, 48 times per second. You can get a new reading of the, of the field. So um, this is, for some applications, this is um, um, rather slow, like I'll mention later, if you're trying to maybe figure out the um, changes in the, in the magnetic field of the CPU per each instruction cycle, that, that is too slow. But for our purpose of uh, covert communication, this is this, the 48 hertz is actually quite, quite sufficient. But of course, if you have a dedicated sensor, you might have a better, better reading frequency. Um, and for some, uh, for some reference, the magnetic field near the, near the Earth's surface, around 25 to 60 microtesla, uh, whereas the, if, you, if you measure the magnetic field near the, near the CPU or the hard drive of your computer, it's going to be few to tens to maybe at most 100 microtesla. So the, so the Earth's magnetic field um, can actually influence your measurements quite a lot. So ideally, you, um, since you have in the, in the sensors, you can measure x, y, or z axis. So ideally, uh, you can look at the measurements in the, in the z axis perpendicular to the, to the Earth's surface. So this way, um, there's the least noise. But um, sometimes, if you don't know, so if you, if you know the, um, kind of that the, the computer is flat and then that the, the phone is laying flat on the, on, the, on the surface, then you can by default use the z-axis. Otherwise, you have to kind of somehow figure out which, which axis measurement gives you the best, uh, the best values and the least noise. So, um, so the Earth's magnetic field can get kind of in the way of your, of your measurements, as can other, other things that I'll, that I'll mention. Uh, so that's a kind of brief overview of how the uh, solid state compass works and kind of where it's found in the phones of you. I don't advise it, but if you want to open up your phone, you'll find a small compass in there. So uh, for the, the next two parts, I want to talk about hard drives, probably familiar with the operation of the hard drive, and also the CPU and how uh, you can generate magnetic fields um, from the operation of the CPU. Uh, oh, by the way, I know this is recorded, but feel free to you know, ask questions if you're not afraid of the question being recorded as well, <laughs> or we can have things during lunch as well. So, um, so this is a, a typical hard drive. You, you, you must be familiar from your computer. Uh, they come in different form factors. Um, the interesting thing is that um, inside the hard drive, there are multiple uh, platters onto which you store data. So um, depending, basically depending on the, um, on the number of platters, that is really one of the factors that influences how much data you can store on the hard drive. So um, uh, as a side note, I, there was a recent proposal to actually uh, thicken the, the hard drive. So there's a standard format for the hard drives, but the, the physical dimensions of the hard drive limit the physical number of, um, of platters that you can have in a hard drive. So um, some, some folks from, uh, from Google are actually proposing if you could make a thicker hard drive, you could have uh, many more platters to store data. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. Um, and uh, you know, there's some you know, different statistics. You might be familiar with the hard drives. But um, the, the interesting thing for us is that the hard drive actually has a, has a metal cover. And in general, um, hard drives are designed to limit the electromagnetic um, interference that they can be causing to other components. So the, so the shielding of the hard drive is, is designed to kind of limit the interference with other uh, things in the, inside the computer. Uh, but as we found in our research, it's not sufficient to, uh, it's not sufficient to fully eliminate uh, signals that you can get out, of, out from the hard drive. So um, at the end, I'll make, mention some uh, potential um, defenses against the work that I'm talking about today. And, and one of them could be, again, kind of thickening the hard drive or thickening the shielding, which uh, may be not practical in the current format for the hard drives. But if you, um, if you follow this Google proposal for bigger, bigger hard drives with more platters, that would mean you'd have maybe more space to actually shield the, um, shield the um, magnetic emanations from the hard drive. Um, and then if you, um, if, you open up, if you open up a hard drive, it's actually a pretty cool exercise um, uh, to you know, see what's inside. So this is kind of, um, maybe you can't see it so clearly, but there are um, four, four main things I wanted to highlight. So, um, so this, is the, um, this is the main platter, or the top platter on which, or disk on which you store the data. So, so a hard drive will have multiple of those disks that are basically constantly spinning. And then here's the arm and head assembly. So um, the head of the, so at the end of the um, arm, there's a head, which is a little, basically a little electromagnet that um, is used to um, polarize the, the magnets that are on, on the hard drive. So hard drive is basically ma ma magnetic material, and you switch the, um, the polarization of the magnet um, using the, the head. So that when you operate the hard drive, the head basically swings over to the, uh, to the correct track. And I'll show a picture of the tracks later. 
and then it um, basically passed some current to read or write the, write the data, and then at the end, the head swings back to the, to the stop position. So um, um, again, I don't advise trying this, but sometimes the, the hard drives now have um, accelerometers inside of them, so you can, you can hear the hard drive um, operate, and then if you suddenly uh, try to drop the hard drive, it will actually stop and swing the head back, and you can see that, you can hear that the hard drive actually goes quiet uh, as, as it's being dropped. But, um, but the, whole, the whole process of, of moving the arm to read or write data or to actually to, to hide it, so to say, when you're dropping the hard drive is this actuator. So this is actually the part that kind of is most interesting to us. So we're, um, uh, as a spoiler, I guess, we're, we're, not, we're not able to read the data directly from the head or what's being written or read from the hard drive. Rather, we were able to figure out what, it, what the arm is doing. And then uh, by inference, we can figure out some information of what's happening to the hard drive. But you, you, you cannot, um, at least for now, you cannot read individual bits out from the hard drive. So that's, um, that's potentially one nice thing that it's, you know, you, you, you're only able to get the, the information about the movement of the, um, of the arm. And, um, and this actuator, I don't know if I have a, okay, I don't have a, there's a picture later, but the actuator is essentially two, two permanent magnets. So this is, the, this is the top magnet and then there's a bottom magnet. And in the middle, there's a little coil of wire. Basically that's, if you pass, so again, if you pass the current through the coil of wire, it will um, create an electromagnet and it will, is used to swing the, um, swing the arm. So every time, um, every time you try to move, uh, move the arm, uh, there's a little, a little um, current passed through the electromagnet and then that causes the electromagnetic field that we can kind of pick up from the outside of the, um, of the, of the hard drive. So if, uh, basically, you can s if, there's, if there's something happening inside, the arm is moving, you can uh, detect that via the, as we show, via the sensors on the, on the smartphone. And um, that's, what we, that's what we leverage. And so the idea, uh, the, the principle of the operation of this, um, of this actuator here is um, basically Lorentz force. So the idea is that if you have a, a permanent magnet, which is um, this, this big thing um, on the, um, on, in the hard drive. Um, and then if you have a, a, a wire that's passing some current, so you can't see it, but in, in, inside there's basically a little loop, loop of wire that's attached to the, to the arm, then uh, essentially you create some force. So you'll be able to, by controlling the, so that's the principle for electromagnets. So by controlling current in a loop of wire, um, you create a um, um, magnetic field and it interacts with the permanent magnet and you swing the, um, you swing the head assembly um, over. And then, so this is kind of like a diagram of what happens is that here you have these permanent magnets and then the head assembly. And then when you uh, generate, um, generate uh, current to swing the head, you create some uh, magnetic fields. And then if you have a um, phone, let's say parallel, parallel on the hard drive or nearby, basically you can detect the, the changes in the magnetic fields in the three axes. And that's, um, that's, what, we, um, that's what we use. So um, yeah, so that's, the, uh, that's kind of the, idea for, uh, for measuring the magnetic fields is that even though there is a um, um, casing that protects some of the emanations from the drive, uh, we're able to pick up the information about the movement of, of the hard drive head. And um, later, uh, next slides, I'll also talk about some um, emanations from the CPU that you can pick up from the, from the sensors. And um, as we show, it's possible even through the, um, you know, if you do it next to the, next to the laptop or through the, through the hard drive, through the case of the, um, of the server. Oh, and um, I just as a, some, some side, side information again, so, uh, so this is the picture of the hard drive. I already mentioned that the, the head moves a little bit to, to write data, and in the, the terminology, basically you have a sector where you write data on a sector, and each sector is within, uh, within a track, and then you have these multiple platters. So by measuring the magnetic field relative to, um, um, to, to the movement of the head, we're um, kind, of, kind of able to figure out effectively which, which set of tracks the, the hard drive is accessing. So you, you, can, you can figure out how far the head moves, to, so which track is being accessed, um, but uh, you might not be able to figure out the exact sector or the exact platter. So, so the information is um, only limited to, to effectively the track on, on, the, on, the, on the hard drive. And um, how does that relate to uh, finding out information about what's going on inside your, um, inside your application or your system? So, um, in, a, in a modern system, essentially for each, um, for each process, uh, you know, you store files as, as file objects. So if you, for your process, you have a table that describes all the, let's say, open files that the process has. And then each, um, 
each, uh, each the, the handle basically points, points to some information about the location of the, um, of the file on the, on the actual disk. So basically, different applications, when they access different, um, different files, um, may, the files may be located on the different tracks, so you can actually distinguish some operation of the application by, by measuring the, um, by measuring the uh, magnetic field. Um, all right, so that's the that's an overview of hopefully familiar about what's going on inside the um, inside the CPU. I'm sorry, inside the hard drive. And next uh, about the CPU. So um, basically, when you have your CPU operating or your computer operating, um, the the CPU or the motherboard or some other computers can generate three types of emanation. So one um, is the electromagnetic um, emanation from the uh, from the from the CPU itself. Um, interestingly enough, you can also have um, RF, um, radio frequency signals. So there's been recent work a um, um, few years ago, not, not so long ago, on basically measuring the sound from the capacitors. So you can uh, listen to the, uh, to the sounds that the capacitors are making inside the computer to figure out what's, um, what's going on. Um, and of course, there's also the, the, the thermal energy. So uh, the, the more work your CPU does, the more, more heat you're generating. So, um, so these are all different interesting um, Things you could measure from from the from the CPU that's going on, um, and in this work we uh, we focus on the uh, on the electromagnetic emanation. So so again, um, basically any time you have some current going through a wire, you will generate um, electromagnetic field that you can pick up, and this electromagnetic field is going to be related to, uh, in some sense, to what the CPU is doing. So you can think of um, you know, what instruction the CPU is executing, whether there's some multi-threading going on. Um, you know whether you're accessing the processor caches. So um, different different operations of the CPU uh, will generate some different signatures. And um, there are basically you can look at the uh, CPU electromagnetic emanations at two granularities. So you can look at um, fine and coarse grain granularity. So um, we're doing the the coarse grain. I just want to actually highlight the fine grain because there's recent work, um, and at least in the U.S. there's been um, uh, DARPA, the military agency, has been um, promoting research on literally uh, you know, listening to the EM radiations on the chip and figuring out exact instructions that the CPU is executing. So uh, this is where researchers go with an electromagnetic probe um, or multiple probes right on the CPU to try to figure out, no, is this an end instruction or or instruction what the CPU is doing? So this is uh, very fine-grained EM monitoring, uh, whereas what we're doing is very coarse-grained. So the, um, as I was showing in the pictures, the, the phone and the sensors Outside of the laptop, it's pretty far from the source, so we're not <laughs> we're not anywhere close to being able to get the individual instructions that the CPU is doing. But still, there's um, kind of sufficient signature to to generate um, a covert channel by modulating the amount of work that the that the CPU is doing. All right, so <laughs> that was the background. So let's get into the <laughs> into the interesting part. I hope I haven't bored you too much yet. So uh, we have uh, basically two topics. Our first paper. Um, with Sebastian was on basically on side channels and figuring out what the uh, what the laptop or a server is doing, uh, mostly based on the operation of the hard drive. Um, and our more recent work uh, with uh, Nicholas um, is looking at generating covert channels by modulating the operation of the hard drive or the um, or the CPU. Um, all right. So um, uh, as one uh, as one kind of setup for the for the for these research projects, so the idea was to basically use an unmodified smartphone, so something that's uh, very you know inconspicuous. Everybody has a has a smartphone. It's not unusual to to carry one. Uh, it might be actually unusual if you don't carry one <laughs> these days. So um, so if you if you use a smartphone for attack, it's not not very suspicious. And I also I, again um, you know there is many you know free or malicious apps that you can uh, by accident download on your phone and you might not see that they're getting these permissions to use the sensors. So it's, uh, so it's a very uh, convenient tool for, uh, for doing any sort of, uh, sort of, sort of attack. And uh, to get into some, some pictures and some graphs, so um, um, the, first, the, first, the very first thing we're interested in, we're looking at, um, at the magnetic field, how it's generated from the, from the hard drive and how to, um, you know, what information we can extract from it. And so, um, this is kind of roughly one of the setups where the hard drive is um, obviously removed from the computer. Um, I'll show you some pictures later. We uh, have work with you actually outside of the chassis of the computer or outside of the laptop. So this is kind of most convenient. But uh, you know this very um, unscientific method of uh, you know printed grid on the paper, we can eff effectively control the distance from the hard drive to measure the 
uh, the impact of the, of the magnetic field. And uh, as a reference, at least for this type of the hard drive, um, the, the bottom part is where the, where the actual platters are. And then the, the magnet and then the head assembly is towards the, the SATA connector. So this is, so obviously the phone is kind of conveniently placed next to, the, next to where the head assembly is. You know, if you place your phone down, uh, things work as well, but the distance is a, a distance. You know, instead of measuring this distance, you'd have to measure some sort of um, diagonal distance. But this is the rough setup. Um, Sebastian wrote a very nice app for the, um, for the Android operating system. Again, there's no special permissions. You have to give it to access the, access the sense. And, um, so uh, we looked at many, uh, many different parameters. So for example, we're interested how, how far away from the hard drive you can uh, observe some information. So um, this graph effectively tells, shows the, uh, so the different bars are the, um, are the distance that the phone is located from the, um, from the hard drive. So we're, I believe we're looking basically from the, from the edge of the hard drive. So the, the distance to the actual head assembly is a little bit, um, a little bit longer. And uh, essentially, you have this an average of 50 runs of writing some. So the hard drive writes some 128 megabyte file. What is kind of what is the signature? And um, the interesting thing you can see is um, so this the first peak is um, the writing of the file. So when you start writing the file, the the, the hard drive head gets um, deflected. Um, so there's uh, some magnetic field generated. The head is being held in position to write the data. Uh, we don't know what data it's writing, but by measuring the time. Uh, a later show we can figure out how much data it's writing at least. Um, and then this is an interesting thing. Um, this depends on the, on the firmware of your hard drive. But uh, as far as we know, effectively what happens is the hard drive head deflects. You're writing some data. And then it basically kind of holds itself waiting for more data to be written. So if in, in case you're doing more writes, it will be easier to kind of go back to the hard drive. And if nothing happens, then again, it, if, if you remember on the first picture, basically kind of goes into this hidden position where it's off the platters. So let's say it doesn't get damaged if you drop the hard drive. So, so this is interesting thing that the firmware actually you know, tries to wait a little bit to see if you're going to do something else. And um, in this case, um, so this is, the, this is normalized to the noise. So you can see that at a distance of about three, three to four centimeters, we're still able to, um, to detect um, some, um, some operation of the hard drive. And the limit was around six or seven eventually. But after that, it's, it's everything is buried in the noise. So the distance is, is very limited. Um, but as I'll show in some pictures, it's more than sufficient. If you look at a server, you know, the distance from the hard drive through the chassis to the top is one or two centimeters. So this is more than, uh, more than sufficient. And um, I already mentioned, um, we, we looked at you know, how much you know, 128 megabytes versus 256 megabytes. So um, basically, the, the width of the first peak varies depending on how much data you're um, you're writing. So this is the, the first interesting thing uh, is that basically you can figure out what size of the file you're working with. So, you know, am I, am, am I accessing an MP3 song? Am I accessing a, a movie? Um, so you can, you can start to correlate some, um, some information between the width of the, of the recorded peak and uh, the amount of data that's being, um, that's being written or, or read. So actually, this works for reading or writing because we're really looking at just at the, at the head movement. So it's the it's the same. Um, the, this, is, um, this is interesting thing. So as I mentioned um, earlier, this picture of the file table. So each process, uh, when it's using um, some files, um, basically has a handle to point to the file in the disk. And then each, di each, um, each file is going to be located in a different location on the disk. So uh, when, a, uh, when you're accessing the files, um, the hard drive head actually has to move different distances based on the location of the, of the file on one of the platters and the tracks. So, um, we, um, so I, I believe this was um, Sebastian was looking at um, playback of different movies. So if you play different movies on the, um, from the hard drive, you can see the, this is the, OK, maybe you can't see, but there's a solid line or dashed line that shows the average for the three files and the three files. And you can see that there's a, there's a clear distinction um, between which file is being accessed. So by measuring the, um, the average kind of the magnetic field outside the hard drive, you could, um, in, this, in this experiment, you could distinguish, um, distinguish between the, which, roughly which, which, which of the three files are, um, are being accessed. And of course, it helps if, the, if, one, ha if one file is, um, is accessed at the beginning of the hard drive, and the, uh, at the, at the, sorry, at the edge of the platter, and one on the inside edge, then uh, of course, this difference is, is much bigger. So uh, typically, the hard drive kind of fills up the files from either from the, from the center out or from the out inside. So 
Uh, you, could, you could say something about the, the, the history of the file, so which file was written first, uh, which file was written later, depend, that's the kind of the location on the, on the, um, um, on the disk. And um, all right, so there's some, uh, some maybe actual pictures for of, your, of your interest. So um, this is, um, uh, so all of, this, all of this information, we're looking at the external hard drive removed from the, uh, from the chassis. And this is a picture of our, um, of our lab servers. So um, this is the server under test. And then basically, we, uh, we place the smartphone um, in the proximity of where the hard drive is located inside the, the chassis and everything is still there. There's no secret hole underneath the tape, so <laughs> everything is OK. And uh, basically, we, show, we tried to use this to show that, you know, let's say some um, unscrupulous maintenance person could come in, and while they're working on another server, they just put their phone on, on this server, and they gather information of what's, um, of what's going on. And um, one, one thing that we looked at is uh, trying to identify, for example, which virtual machines are running on a server. So again, um, a virtual machine is nothing else than a, basically a process that's running. And if it has some storage, then it will um, um, be, a, be accessing those files. So, uh, so set up um, a server. That this, is the, this is the server that you see. Um, and basically set up with uh, multiple virtual machines. And then uh, when, the, when, the multi when the virtual machine runs, uh, you can measure the magnetic field, um, I believe, the setup was you know, you're starting the virtual machine and, and doing some operation and then shutting it down. Uh, so this is at the, at, at the startup phase. Uh, and then you can see that for each virtual machine, um, the signature is a little bit different. So you could distinguish, potentially distinguish, which, which virtual machine is doing some activity. So um, a sample scenario is, um, let's say, uh, you try to figure out, is, is this a virtual machine located on this server? So you could trigger virtual machines might have like a web server or some other application. So you might, let's say, trigger uh, a large file download from a server running in, in, in this data center. And then you could see, you know, is there, is there a sudden peak in the operation of the, of the server and of the, um, of the virtual machine. So it's, um, it's basically detecting whether which files are being accessed on the hard disk, but we can correlate it to, um, uh, to the virtual, virtual machine operation. Um, and again, uh, we should have put absolute values here, but Again, you can also detect if there is a, a file being downloaded. So again, so when you try to um, download a file, obviously the VM will go to the, to the disk, and you have a sudden peak or a trough in the, in the measurement. So, um, this, so the, the, the value of the, of the measurements really depends on the, on, the location of the, on the relative location of the phone to the, um, to the, um, to the source of the, of the signal. Um, and this was actually a very interesting, uh, in interesting experiment. So we're trying to figure out, can you detect whether a file that is being accessed on a server has been uh, recently accessed or not? So the idea is that if, you, if a server accesses a file, typically it's actually put into a, into a software cache. So you don't have to go back to the hard drive. You just fetch it from the software cache. And if the file has not been recently accessed, then it's basically flushed. And when it, every time you, uh, you try to get the file, you have to go um, to the disk to, to actually retrieve it. So there is some electromagnetic um, emanations we can capture. So um, out, of, out of these 16 files, can you guys guess which two files were the cached files on the server? Which, so, there, so they're among, so they're. 11 and 5. Yep, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so 11 and 5. So you can see, so this is the time. And um, okay, I guess I should have explained that the color basically is the strength of the magnetic field that's measured. And you can see when the, basically at this point around three seconds, um, the, file, uh, the file access begins and it lasts um, around two seconds and then it ends. And so for these files, there's a lot of, um, lot of um, activity on the hard disk. So obviously something is being fetched. Whereas for, this, um, for these files, um, there is um, very little activity. So um, you can and basically we, we double checked ourselves that yes, these were, we, we read this file. So we read this file multiple times to make sure it's in the software cache, and then we did the experiment. Whereas here, this is the very first time you read the file, so well, we guarantee that it's not in the software cache. Um, interestingly, there is some activity uh, you could see here at the end or the beginning, so uh, that might be related to the, um, to the OS or something recording information about access or the journaling. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, in general, there is a very, um, very clear pattern. And, um, and, as, and typically, actually, this I, maybe I should have mentioned this before. Typically, before each experiment, we did two or three seconds of just 
just measurement without any activity to get the baseline of what is the magnetic field, and then the, then the experiment started. So um, on most of the graphs, you don't see the first three seconds because it's <laughs> uninteresting. Um, and uh, so this was, uh, so all of this uh, work so far was done, like I showed, outside of that server, just measuring the, uh, the magnetic field with, uh, with one hard drive. Uh, we have um, another server that has a RAID set up with two hard drives working in RAID 1. That means they're um, identically duplicating data, uh, which actually I had to replace recently, which is really nice because you just pull one out and put it back in. <laughs> but uh, with the, so you can, in this graph, you can see that the, um, that no RAID is the blue graph here, and then with RAID 1, so this is two disks um, working in parallel. So um, the data is um, slightly, slightly amplified because now you have two, um, two hard drives working together. Um, but actually, um, it's not clear if this is very advantageous because uh, the drives might not be synchronized and, and you know, one drive, the noise from one drive will interfere with the other drive. So um, yes, the magnetic field uh, gets stronger, but um, I, I don't know if that's so advantageous. It, it works fine with one hard drive and um, you don't have to worry about synchronization of the disks. And, and, and if it's a different rate configuration, um, it's actually a different RAID configuration where it stripes the data might, that might be beneficial as a defense because then different hard drives are different, writing different parts of the data, so you create some noise. So, that, so if you have a server with RAID, uh, maybe that's a potential defense against this type of vul you know, vulnerability or attack where you, you use different RAIDs, uh, which would actually be kind of nice. Um, and besides the server, we, uh, we looked also at different laptops. So this was one of the first experiments um, uh, so it's Acer or Asus laptop, and again, so this is the, the phone with the app that's doing the, the measurement, um, and then roughly in this area is where the hard drive is located inside the, inside the laptop. So um, you can see that, you can imagine that somebody is, um, you know, working on their laptop and maybe they place their phone next to the laptop because they're just using it as well. So the phone can actually gather information about what's going on inside the, um, inside the laptop. And uh, we did some experiments Again, you can, for example, you can try to detect what operating system is putting up. So again, different operating systems will have different um, set of files that they're accessing in different, um, in different sequence. So um, we took, uh, so this is average of, I believe Sebastian usually took uh, 20 or 50 trials to, make, to get a good average. But you can see that reliably this Linux um, uh, 12, 1204 has a different signature from, from Windows 7. And um, the first, you can see that the, uh, so time zero here is when the, when the machine turns on. So there's some um, fixed uh, uh, initialization that causes some disk activity. Uh, and then around here, nine seconds is where, where the actual OS starts booting up. And from this point on, you can uh, start distinguishing uh, the different OS. And as a side note, you might actually be able to use this pattern to try to distinguish, you know, is the server being restarted or is, are things booting up? So it's, um, so it's quite quite interesting. Um, you might actually be able to try to defend some against some of this if you, um, if you upgrade your OS or add extra packages that cause different files to be accessed during boot up so you can um, get, a, get a different signature. So that's actually um, a potential, potential defense. But if you, know, if you have a same, same OS with, you know, with, with no updates, then each time you boot it up, you could get this, uh, you could get this signature. And, um, this, was, this was getting a little bit more noisy, so not so reliable, but again, each application has a pattern as well. So each application accesses different files, and so here you could distinguish, let's say, Firefox from um, OpenOffice or LibreOffice starting up. So again, if the, if the user is working on their, on their laptop and they have their phone next to them, uh, you could potentially distinguish what applications they're, um, they're starting up, uh, which might be, a, might be an interesting, um, interesting um, thing to find out about the user. Um, all right, so that was, um, that was our earlier work that we focused on uh, magnetic hard drives and kind of um, leaking side channel information. And uh, more recently, uh, we've been looking at um, covert communication. So basically, you generate the magnetic fields um, on purpose, either using um, a CPU or, again, the hard drive, and then uh, figuring out how to, how to communicate um, that to a, to a nearby smartphone. Um, so, um, so I, as you know, covert communication is basically kind of abusing um, channels unintended to, for use for communication to actually send, um, send some data. Typically, 
um, the, com the convert channels are very slow, so we're not going to be sending a lot of data, but focusing on a, on a cryptographic key, for example. That's typically what you want to leak out of a, out of a system. Um, and then, as I already showed this picture, you, know, you, could, you could use mm, heat, you could use electromagnetic, or you could use RF signals for the co covert communication. And um, in this case, we're, uh, we're looking at the um, electromagnetic um, emanations from the hard drive or the CPU. So actually, for, uh, for this project, uh, Nicholas took over this project. Um, and uh, it seems that the CPU is actually a better source for, uh, for electromagnetic um, radiation if you, for the covert channel, because you can modulate the, the operations and the, kind of the load on the CPU uh, slightly better than dealing with the, with the hard disk and writing and reading files. So uh, that's quite, quite interesting. Um, so what we started off first was, um, what we started off first was with the, was still with the hard disk, and then later on we moved to the CPU. But the, the idea is very, very simple, and it, uh, at short distances it works uh, quite well. Effectively, uh, you can modulate uh, basically access to, uh, to some files through your application. So again, any application can create files. And then depending on whether the application is um, accessing some file or not accessing the file, you have a different, uh, different pattern from the hard drive. So you could, you could have a simple, you know, simple scheme where you, have, where you want to send 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. You you do let's say three um, three file accesses to uh, to create some ones and then you do not do three file accesses to generate some zeros and uh, this would be the um, the simplest the simplest kind of scheme the, um, the 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 problem is that it's you know it's hard to distinguish where the uh, where the one ends or the, the, the zero begins so you need to some sort of actual um, encoding scheme for the um, for the communication. Uh, so we looked at two, uh, two different schemes uh, for well known to communications. So one is um, on-off keying, and then the second is a digital square wave frequency modulation. So uh, with on-off keying, um, the idea is very simple. You divide your time into fixed um, time intervals. So these are the, the time intervals. And then within um, the time interval, um, let's say you either have a peak, so you have some access to indicate, um, uh, indicate a one, or you have a zero to have no, no access. So uh, you, can, um, you can gather um, gather the measurements over time, and then you can uh, basically, uh, in each time period, figure out whether there was, there was a peak or, or there was no peak. So, so this, this way, your, um, your bandwidth is reduced, because you can send only one, one bit of information for each, for each time period. But you have, uh, but essentially, rather than just you know, doing things next to each other, um, there is some there is some spacing, so you can more clearly distinguish whether there is there is one, one and zero. And um, uh, I'll mix, explain the next scheme shortly. But the idea is that basically, uh, before you, so the problem is that you have to somehow line up the, the transmitter and then the receiver somehow has to line up these uh, these slots to be able to decode the information correctly. So the idea, uh, the simple idea, is to have a fixed preamble. So let's say you have a fixed pattern of. One one zero zero one one zero zero something like that before so you would have a fixed preamble and then you have the actual payload which is your data so what what the what the what the receiver on the smartphone can do is you can record the information um, uh, from the transmitter and then kind of go back in time and and scan uh, scan the recorded uh, data to see uh, am I seeing this one one zero zero one one zero zero and if you see such a pattern then you know it's the preamble. And you kind of can synchronize yourself to where the where each window should be, and then you can read um, read the rest of. It. So you know after the preamble, uh, you you read some data that follows it. So so you have to design a simple protocol. Um, in our case, um, I believe it's eight bits for the preamble, and then sixteen bits for the data. So now you have a simple protocol that there's a preamble, and then the payload, and then once you have that, you can uh, build on top of that where you have you know multiple what we call these frames, are combined together by having some, the payload can be actually a sequence number plus some, plus some data. So you can pretty much build a, a networking or a communication protocol, um, although it's very slow, so you don't want to send too much, uh, too much data. Um, the, in the difference from the on-off keying to the, uh, the frequency modulation scheme is that uh, this, um, this uh, very much depends on your ability to um, detect, um, detect the peaks and then um, so as the s distance increases, the, the scheme is not so good because the peaks start hiding um, in the noise. Whereas with the frequency modulation scheme, 
you have the same thing. You divide your time into different, um, um, different windows. But then uh, inside, the, inside the time frame, uh, depending on how many magnetic field changes there are, um, basically that's 1 or 0. So you can see this is, uh, these are changes at, at one frequency, and these are magnetic field changes at another frequency. So um, basically, instead of looking at the, um, at the absolute value of the peak, you're just looking at the different frequencies, and you try to distinguish ones, uh, ones and zeros. Um, and uh, yes, and then so too, so uh, okay, I guess I already spoiled it by saying that the on, on of king is not so good, but to kind of analyze it, uh, we looked at, 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 different, um, at different laptops, and uh, in the, okay, maybe you can't see so clearly, so for each, so for each laptop and then the hard drive, there is some point location that is kind of the source of the, of, the, um, of the signal. So in this case, for the Lenovo laptop, I believe this is where this about where the CPU is located. Um, and same for the, um, for the Mac computer. And then for the hard drive, this is would, where, the, where the head assembly would be. And then as a distance from the, um, uh, from the, from the source of the information, from s source of the signal increases, your signal is going to uh, decrease. And these are the the nice graphs, and it follows very much the the expected exponential decay of the of the strength of the signal. So if you're close, it's very good, and then it very quickly decays. So uh, so the electromagnetic theory works. That's <laughs> that's good. Um, and so to and so to almost wrap up to analyze the which scheme is most effective, we looked at the um, at the error rates in transmitting information using um, our protocol, and then there. Uh, there are two laptops, so these would be the, the Lenovo and the, and, and the MacBook. And then the dotted line shows the on-off keying, and then the, the solid line is the, uh, the square wave frequency modulation scheme. And you can see that as the distance, um, so this is 0, this is about 10, this is about 20 centimeters. As the distance increases, the uh, bit error rate starts increasing. And but what you can see is that the on-off keying um, basically breaks down much quicker than the, 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 the frequency modulation scheme. So, so, the, so the frequency modulation scheme would be preferred method for, um, for doing the communication. The bit rate is a little bit slower, but here, you know, so you can trade off the, the bit rate and, and then the distance. And um, as, a, as a kind of a farther analysis, we also looked at how, um, how at least internal noise to the, to the computer could affect uh, could affect this, so um, I should. Oh yeah, so I should have highlighted that these measurements are now done from the from the CPU. So um, you could do similar analysis for the hard drive, but at least for these laptops, it seems that the, it was much easier to generate the modulate what the CPU is doing, and then measure the, that that activity. And um, as a as to see how the internal noise um, affects this, so if you can see this green line here. Uh, should correspond to this orange line here, so they have about the about the same shape. And then, so this is no um, no other things going on on your computer. And then you can see uh, predictably, let's say if you have some if if you have some video playing back, so one CPU core might be used to to, to do the operation to generate the magnetic field, and then um, then the second CPU core might be used for video playback. So now the CPU is doing some work. So you get more noise, so your distance gets shorter. And then you know, if you have some I.O. activity, it gets even shorter. So um, in, in, in practice, you know, if your computer is doing many things, there'll be a lot of noise, so your, your distance gets, gets shorter. But still, you can see that it's on the order of you know, um, you know, between 20, 10 to 20, 20 centimeters. I would say that, I would say that you know, at 10 centimeters, it's pretty, pretty reliable. And you know, 10 centimeters you know, is your 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 phone next to your laptop, or you know your phone on on, the, on top of the CPU chassis. It's not that um, not that far. So um, I, I guess I already mentioned this, but um, based on this analysis, uh, uh, Nicholas focused on the um, on the uh, frequency modulation scheme and um, designed a, a communication simple protocol where you have the preamble and then the payload, and then the preamble has some fixed pattern so you can detect it. Uh, uh, when you're scanning, so you'd record the magnetic field, and then offline you would scan it to detect the information that was sent. And you can inside the payload, you can do whatever, put some sequence numbers, for example, to um, to do a bigger bigger scheme. And okay, so so the idea again is that 
you record, you record the measurements for, for some n minutes. Uh, and then inside that measurement, you try to find the preamble and then decode the payload. And if you fail um, to find the preamble, basically you wait for 2n minutes and then you try again. And then n, um, n was set up such that, um, I guess in this case it's 8 minutes, such that within the n period, um, you could fit the whole preamble um, and, the, uh, and the payload. So here for the frequency modulation with the, the, the basic unit of uh, 15 seconds, uh, your 16-bit you know, your payload with the 8-bit preamble takes a, a 6 minutes. So if you, if you, you should be able to capture it within that 8-minute um, period. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so I think that's, that's uh, basically coming to, to the end. I have uh, <laughs> three minutes left. So um, the covert communication, I think it's very, very interesting in terms of that you can actually use your, you know, the operation of the hard drive or the CPU and possibly other components um, to send, send the information. And um, just to wrap up, uh, you know, how, how serious um, is the problem? So um, depends how you look at it. I, I think in, in general, the, the distance is limited to a few, to few 10 centimeters. So uh, it's, um, you, you, can, you can control it you know, in, a, in a server room. You can lock the cabinet. You could control it pretty well. Um, you know, in the, um, in, the, in, in the laptop scenario, I don't know, I'd have to be very close to you with my phone to record something what you're doing, so maybe it's not practical. But then um, in, the pap in the papers we mentioned the idea, and if there's a maintenance person that does, um, that does work, that already has the access to the server cabinet, or, you know, I just download some game that happens to use the magnetic sensor that I don't know about, so I'm, I'm going to place my phone next to the, um, next to the phone. So, um, so in general, um, you know, sensors are getting better. There's more devices. Now you have all this Internet of Things. Who knows what kind of sensors they have? Um, there was a recent article about the TVs listening or sending ultrasonic signals to the IoT devices. It's very, you know, there's a lot of sensors around. So um, if this side or covered channel doesn't work, there will be new ones that people, uh, people discover. And um, some, some, some notes about potential de defenses. So um, better electromagnetic shielding will be the the best thing to do, like I mentioned, thicker hard drive stickers, um, server cases, but it's, uh, uh, well, it's basically economics, you know, you have to invest more, the server now costs you more, so maybe not so, not so practical to, to, uh, to do cost. Um, you can increase the noise, especially for the hard drives, you could do dummy hard disk operations, uh, good, good solution, but again, cost you, cost you performance. Maybe you could try this RAID, different RAID configuration to add noise intrinsically, that, that's something. Um, it could be interesting to detect the presence of the smartphones nearby. I mean, if the, if the smartphone has sensors, why couldn't your server or your laptop have sensors and try to figure out if somebody is nearby? But um, I don't know, that's somehow, I don't, know, I don't have a good idea how that would actually work in practice. And if somebody doesn't use the smartphone, they can use a smartwatch, they can use your thermostat, I don't know. So it's, uh, the attacker has a lot of things they can try. Um, you could try to detect suspicious CPU or disk activity that, um, uh, machine learning is very popular now. This might be um, this might be something useful. But again, if the attacker is only trying to leak out a, a secret key, they can basically try to stay underneath the noise and do it very infrequently. So you don't, uh, you might not even uh, detect it. Um, one uh, one practical thing that could work if users pay attention is if you require permissions for all the sensors and it's very explicit, uh, you know, what sensors your application is using. Um, the downside is, that at least for myself, you know, if I need an app, I, I have no choice to decline the, the use of the sensor. Either I agree to use the sensors or I don't agree, and it, it's sometimes not clear why, you know, what permissions are there. So um, one, one interesting thing would be, from the software perspective, and I'm sure there are pairs on that, is, you know, could you decline, basically, could you have apps that you decline the permissions and instead you give the operating system, give some random input, so I'd say, I have a, you know, yes, instead of using a physical magnetic sensor, you will use this virtual magnetic sensor that gives you some random data, or maybe it, uh, maybe instead of 48 hertz, it gives you one hertz. I, I don't know why, why would the compass need a 48 hertz so fast? So, so you could do some virtual sensors that the, um, that the OS presents to the application. That could be, that could be practical. So, all right, so, so to conclude, um, Smartphones are uh, getting more sophisticated with all these different, um, different sensors, and um, our work has shown that you can use that as a side or covert channel 
uh, to communicate between the a server or a laptop or an, and a smartphone. Um, there's a lot of other work. People with dedicated equipment are, uh, you know, uh, okay, kind of, you have to have the dedicated equipment so it's not so conspicuous, but, uh, you know, you can do my, you know, any more, many more things. So you can expect that as the sensors in the smartphone get better, um, you know, maybe someday you can actually figure out what instructions the CPU is executing. Um, who knows? So, and it's not just limited to electromagnetic, there's radio frequency heat. So, um, in general, um, on one side, I think people have looked at side and covert channels for a long time. So, uh, but on the other side, it seems there's every time, every conference, there's some new, <laughs> new, new discovery, new attack going on. So, uh, there's still some ways of, you know, understanding what these sensors can, um, can and cannot do. Um, and then we have uh, two papers um, on this topic, uh, one with uh, Sebastian in Financial Crypto last year um, and an Asia South Pacific DAC this year of Nikolai and um, there's a journal paper under review uh, as well. So, uh, you know, if you have some, uh, some ideas ab about this topic, we're, st we're still very interested um, to explore it farther. Like I like Uli mentioned, we have a small group, so I'm really interested to invite people to, to visit for a short visit, for a longer visit. Um, Sebastian actually uh, spent uh, two or three months with us, um, and then uh, Nikolai might come next year. So we'll s there's, there's, we're very welcoming of people coming to work on this on this topic. And I should really thank um, my German collaborators Nikolai, Sebastian, and Professor Katzenbeiser uh, for kind of working with us on this on this topic. And if you want to see some of our work, is caslab.eng.yale.edu. We have the recent papers. Uh, and if the PDF is not there, just email me. I'll, I'll send it to you. And uh, we can uh, arrange to share the code as well. If maybe you can try it out on some different settings. So uh, with that, I think, uh, yeah, I think that, that's it. Thanks so much for, for coming. And uh, thanks for, for listening, <laughs> if you're listening this in the future. So thanks, guys.